Hello, everyone. Uh, here is our next uh, lecture in our series. Um, this one looking at uh, an aspect of African American history and life, particularly um, the incidents around Operation Move um, in 1980s Philadelphia, using that example to investigate uh, some critical themes related to urbanization, race, um, you know, social economics, um, particularly paying attention to uh, those decades around uh, those events. Uh, so with that, we'll take a look and uh, jump right on in. I think it's important just to sort of, you know, really start with uh, just this little trailer. I think this is important just to get us rolling. I don't usually do this, but because the theme and the film is so central to what we do. Uh, I mean, I think you, you want to sort of watch it in the context of the lecture, at least the trailer. So we'll take a quick look here. May 13th, 1985. Years of conflict between the city of Philadelphia and a small urban group known as Moot ended in a violent day-long encounter. It was one of the most devastating days in the modern history of this city. The big story tonight is the effort to evict move. The effort has turned into a disaster. Can you describe the philosophy of move? We were being taught about the corruption in this system. The system, the establishment, you. Did you consider the move organization to be a terrorist group? People who threatened to shoot and kill neighbors, police. I think that's a pretty adequate description of the word terrorist. <laughs> Where is it written that we could not have a religion of our own? The system had one intention, to either kill move people or to put us in prison as long as possible. It's just that simple. More than three dozen Philadelphia policemen surrounded the building after a move member was spotted on the roof wearing a hooded mask and carrying a shotgun. We intend to seize control of the house. We will do it by any means necessary. Every one of us knew that someone was going to die. Did you have a concern that the people inside that house might be in physical danger? Excuse me, just yes, ask me. Well, what we concern is complete insanity. There has just been a huge explosion here. We don't know what it means, but it just shook the whole place. There was a huge blast. <laughs> Did it ever occur to you that this might have been a dangerous device? Yes, ma'am. The fire got real heavy, so we couldn't breathe. Then that's when we started yelling. What did you say? What did you yell? We want to come out. There's no one that I know in city government that would intentionally go out there to burn those people to death. There's no one that I know of could do that. I remember as soon as I scooped them up, he said to me, don't shoot me, don't shoot me. So you can see why, oops, sorry about that. You can see why it's such an important kind of a thing to um, sort of grapple with, you know? I mean, it's a very powerful image and, uh, you know, the events that surrounded it really did put and laid a lot of things to bear. A lot of things were laid to bear, you know, in those moments. Um, and, and for me, like one of the most strongest ways to start to even, you know, sort of unpack some of the social, economic, and racial, and other kinds of uh, realities of urban life in America, uh, you know, the cipher of that for this event, you know, to me has been the work of John Edgar Wyden, particularly his piece. Um, called the Philadelphia Fire, which you're reading a, just a portion of, right? But he makes reference to a theme throughout um, the Red Ghost, right? In his discussion, some of you, you know, you know, we'll, we'll pick it up here in the lecture some, but um, and, and sort of grapple with it, right? Because it's one that he, he draws on. When we're in class, we'll spend some time there as well, so, so sort of evoking out some meaning there, so we can sort of tease through it, right? Um, but that Red Ghost is there, and so. I always sort of uh, began to investigate and think around what that might have uh, sort of encapsulated, right? Particularly in the context of how Wyman is using it, right? And then, you know, this image of this sort of uh, ideation of a red ghost, right? Um, sort of masked behind sort of this sort of reference to 
Native American or early or Aboriginal experience, and then the sort of sort of with the way in which mod, mod modernity is sort of cutting into that, right? Um, and then the sort of you know just just different ways and things to, to think about it, uh, you know, um, a range of things. You know, we can get into some of the sort of spiritual meanings and things there as well. <clears throat> but I think it's a nice reference, particularly if you if, if you use it in in the sort of way in which Wyman is using it to talk about these events, right? And he reads through this great, 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 huge piece here. We won't, I won't do it now because we'll do it in class, right? But, but you see how here, um, what is being described, right? He's making a clear reference to, uh, I mean, the red ghost there is, is, is largely sort of uh, the, the, the last, I mean, it, it's a lot of things. Uh, I think it could be a reference to Native American ghosts, but I, I want to stop short of that, um, especially in the context of how we'll look at it. But it is sort of the sort of uh, looking back it's 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 a phantom sort of looking back in many ways, sort of sort of over time and and the way in which uh, um, from the time of the arrival of folks from maybe other places, uh, um, the sort of grappling with this space and the violence and and the new kind of violence that maybe came with um, this project and process, right? And the rep and 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 the fact that it's sort of repeating itself, and that's sort of where he says a red ghost then as conviction giggles its last laugh. Let me just take away that last sentence. You know, a red ghost then as conviction giggles its laugh, last, last laugh, sorry. Right? So this 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 kind of thing, right? Well, so what could this mean relative to this story of uh this sort of event uh in, in Philadelphia, which again in class we'll unpack it a little bit further. We'll watch more clips of the film and other things so we can sort of get a good gauge of the meaning of it, right? Uh but, but, but what are some of the backdrops to this? I mean, I mean, really, you have some broader backdrops to this, right? So I want to look at some of them, right? And there are a range of them, right? Uh, in the context of the urban experience, right? What, how do we get to this place, right? I mean, so, so, so we gotta, kind of got to talk ourselves through it some, right? Uh, um, and then, so in the decades leading up to those events, what's going on? It's been happening, right? In cities throughout um, the, the, the nations, right? Well, they've had this major crescendo of violence, right? Um, where, you know, you saw people really um, begin to, um, um, you know, riot and there was urban arrest. And, and almost every instance, there was a clash with um, the police. I mean, um, in Watts, um, they arrested a guy who they accused of being drunk. And so the end result was 34 people dead, 900 wounded, and some 4,000 people arrested, right? In Newark, uh, um, again, they, they beat up a black cab driver. So the people, they essentially firebombed the police station. There's four days of rioting, 27 people killed, right? Um, and again, 1967, there comes, uh, 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 you know, something called a blind pig party, uh, where people had come back from, uh, you know, Vietnam, had served in the war, and essentially they started liquor without a license, right? So they come and break the thing up, but you know, they, had, they got extra breaking it up, as you can imagine, and you know, Five days of rioting, 53 people killed on the orders of uh, a relation, the, the father of our, of uh, you know, the former or the current, or he's a senator, <laughs> Mitt, Mitt Romney. Sorry, uh, he ran for some some things, as you guys know. Uh, but uh, he, his father gave the kill order there in uh, Michigan, in Chicago, of course, uh, 68, uh, um, in large part on the wake of the death of uh, of, of Martin Luther King, right? Um, and a, a number of things happening there, right? 11 dead, um, you know, um, 48 people wounded by gunfire, right? Um, several thousand people arrested, right? And those those things remain in rubble. Places in London and West Madison Street remain in rubble. Even as I was as a little kid, I can remember as a little kid, my father going there to bring us there as kids to go to preach at churches on the West Side. We were little kids. And um, the, the streets were still bad. I mean, I mean, I mean, I don't mean, <laughs> there still were buildings that were just torn out and, and, and had no repair to them. No one had had any inkling of doing any fix on them, right? And stayed gutted out for some time until, you know, eventually they would be repaired. But just some 10 years or decades out, it still was looking the same way it looked. This is my point. This is what I'm trying to stress there, right? Um, so, so, so that sort of disconnect, right? And, and why? Why did these urban places become these sort of, these sort of, this sort of, this sort of, this sort of bottom, right? I mean, what's going on? What's the history? What are some of the dynamics at work? And we're just touching some of the, the points of this, hopefully to elicit obviously more conversation, particularly in the lens of these events 
uh, uh, that lead us up to what's going to happen in Philadelphia and these other eruptions that we see that are maybe precursors to anything as well, right? They're all hint, hint there. I mean, I mean, again, if we go back to that just for a second, all those things, you know, they predate um, move by a decade. I mean, I'm sorry, two decades, right? I mean, and you could say, you know, um, so what, you know, what's going on here, right? What's going on here? Um, what, what's the disconnect? Why, why isn't it that um, people aren't paying better attention to this? Um, because even if you went back a couple of decades early, you could probably could make the case that you had similar incidences and, and tensions and frustrations. What are we missing here? These are the kinds of things I think we have to maybe start sort of more critically ask now. I think we're in a space now where we can more critically ask, right? And there were concerted efforts. This is part of the thing, right? All of that come out, everything that comes out of the civil rights movement uh, um, from, you know, uh, strengthening uh, the civil rights le legislation um, to uh, some of the reforms to vo voting rights and other things. Um, I mean, all of those things, right? Uh, uh, start to spur out of the efforts of folks like MLK, folks like Malcolm X. I mean, you guys know, so we don't have to get into the sort of nut, uh, you know, you know, nuts and bolts of that because we, we know that groundswell movement of folks coming back after the end of World War II, come back and say, you know what? This is the last time we're doing this. We're not doing this no more until we start getting some things in a more equal spot. And that's when you saw the, 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 the enrollment in, in, in groups like the NAACP just shoot up through the roof. You have black people coming from the South as migrants heading into these uh, urban and urban centers, right? And for, uh, taking these jobs and, and these kinds of things. This is happening, right? So, you know, yeah, so you, you got some potential flashpoints, obviously that are gonna, 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 gonna manifest, right? Um, but 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 in the wake of all that tension, right? The work of King, the work of other leaders, and I just keep saying his name because he becomes the uh, just the sort of you know just the, the, the spear point of this, right? But we, we would be remiss not to mention some of the many many others, right? Uh, C. T. Vivian who passed right away, John Lewis, right, who just recently passed. Those are two that come right early on to mind. Many many others. Good Lord, if we start talking, this is that's a whole separate class. I mean, the range of folks and the efforts that they did to, but, but that generation, that gen, that generation, that genesis of movement and political tension uh, uh, and reform and marching and walking and all those things, that's what brought to fruition the economic and political changes that become a stepping stone, right? And you could go ahead and say, you know, well, the Peace Corps didn't do nothing for nobody or no, that wouldn't be true. And I mean, the domestic Peace Corps too, you'd be dead wrong if you sit here and so told me that, right? Uh, or, uh, or you said that Head Start didn't help out kids in the 70s and that you didn't know anybody who went to Head Start. You could, what I mean, because you probably just didn't know. You didn't know. You probably were saying that you, you, you lived in those places or you grew up in those experiences, but probably you just were heard something from somebody because <laughs> if you were there, you already know what time it is, right? Um, so anyways, I mean, I mean, but this, these, were, these were concerted efforts, right? Uh, uh, um, maximum feasible participation of community. Right, this kind of thing, right? Uh, um, um, but but there, ultimately, there becomes there becomes some points of tension that will start to sort of play out. And since we're going to sort of unpack this subject a little bit more, we can look at some local examples. To have some other sorts of film examples um, that we can we can sort of investigate that really will again help sort of reiterate what's really been happening in all of these cities, including Chicago, right? Uh, in terms of this sort of what, what we would call quote unquote white what white backlash uh, uh, um, to um, the limited success of these programs, right? Uh, the limited success of these programs, right? And, and that, you know, this sort of idea of local politicians and Congress feeling that these programs empowered African-Americans. So people feel them like, oh, we, well, we gave these people enough, this kind of thing, right? I mean, just this kind of thing. But all right, we're gonna disable that aspect for now. Uh, because it plays out in the events that John Edgar Wyman and these other, uh, you know, uh, the film and other things sort of move, Operation Move itself, I should say, um, so, sort of sort of conveyed to us, right? Uh, um, and uh, uh, in, in the wake of prior efforts by the NAACP, the SCLC, the Black Panther Party, okay, do I need, do I need to get started this on this, on this, on this, on this sort of multi-generational efforts here? Right? And this being sort of the peak of this, right? In the, in the context of Operation Move, that, that being the emphasis here. But here again, draw ourselves to something particular that's relevant, right? In this experience, right? How much money goes to help in Vietnam and how much money goes to help to deal with the war on poverty here in this country, right? And if you're wondering why or how it wasn't working, these, this is part of why it's not working, right? And yeah, no, money isn't a fix-all. 
right? Um, you know, that's what I liked about, you know, the thing we looked at last week, because through that example, you could see that sometimes money's not going to fix everything, right? Uh, uh, um, so, so there's got to be a sort of a transformation in the mind that has to occur. That's fundamental, right? Uh, um, the money you can do all you want, but still here, this is glaring and problematic, especially if you're not even putting money in education, right? And while we're on the subject of Vietnam, let's take a look at, at Vietnam, and particularly, let's take a look at the level of Black soldiers and their participation in Vietnam, right? Uh, uh, um, you know, I mean, this goes back, you know, people say, well, why, why, why are you talking about uh, 1857, Napoleon III, um, the French occupation of uh, uh, what they called uh, in, in Indochina at the time? Well, I mean, why, why, what does that got to do with anything, right? Well, if you're going to walk around here and start d talking all this colonialist talk about everything is post-colonial and post-coloniality, and that's the new big, big phrase and words and all these things, okay, these are the kinds of connections you're going to have to sort of be a, a, at the tip of the, 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 the conversation. Because this is the more sort of, sort of maybe more um, um, advanced or uh, more 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 on the on the spear point of colonialist process. This is the spear point when you come in and you and you cut everybody down, right? I mean, things are ugly, and we could talk about ourselves in a post-colonial state, but we're not getting mowed down here. Okay, let's be clear, right? Let's be clear, right? And so like this, this puts and projects folks like Ho Chi Minh to the forefront of a sort of, of, a, of an effort to say to his country, we have to save our country, right? This kind of a thing, right? Uh, um, and um, you know, became a student, it became knowledge, studied re uh, revolutionary politics or what will be considered revolutionary politics because they were anti-capitalist, right? Um, the work of Karl Marx, um, the, in general, the whole socialist socialist uh, theory, right? And then the sort of maybe more practical applications, Lenin's work, that amounts to ton, both of them as critical writers and investigators of the so uh, of, of you know communism as politics, essentially. Let's say let's say that, um, as as well as a range of uh, kinds of other things, you know, we just get into right. Uh, um, but so he he gets ready because 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 he gets ready, and you know the, the way the the war will play out, this Cold War stuff is playing out. It's really a, 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 a sort of tension between this sort of first world, third world stuff. That's part of what's at work. There are other features. I mean, and then you, these are rabbit hole kinds of things because you end up talking about a range of stuff if you're gonna, if you're gonna investigate uh, um, something like the Cold War and the way it's gonna play in all of this, right? I mean, I mean, but it's a feature. Let's just, let's just put it there, right? Um, but also too is the economic sort of underpinnings, right? Of the West and their promotion of capitalism against and, and over that of, uh, uh, of an East, right? Which, um, you know, Russia, China, this kind of thing, okay? Um, so, so in that sort of space, right? Uh, uh, Vietnam becomes a, a sort of proving ground. When the French get kicked out because they can't hold on to the place, right? Uh, what will ultimately occur, right? Well, um, the United States will come in and, and sort of be the rescuer, right? And in doing so, um, you know, um, they, you know, part of the process of the rescue is to sort of keep it from communism, right? And so the country itself gets torn apart over this very issue, right? Excuse me, but despite, you know, we were dropping bombs and bringing in troops, right? The South Vietnamese were unable to defeat, with the help of the United States, the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese forces who had the support of the Chinese, right? Um, at least in terms of weapons and arms, right? Um, and so, uh, I mean, this, these folks are gonna fight for their country. The Viet Cong were gonna fight for their country. Ho Chi Minh and the Viet Cong said, we will dig holes in the ground, we will organize. I mean, you could get into the extensive ideation and processes that they went to, and we probably will, as we discuss this in class some. Um, um, why? The how and why of this that they went and what what was their goal and how to what effort and to what degree they went to to sort of sort of to ultimately win their country and it took them i mean they, they, they took them a century it took them almost a century if you if you say uh, um the french invasion by 1857 is is the first real evidence of like and actually you had earlier evidences and arguments for it, but this sort of western occupation this outside colonial French force, right? It will be that will be taken over by the American. It's going to be a century or so before they get us. It's the 70s when they're flying out of there, right? Hotel Saigon, that is the, the scenes of those events, right? Those events as they play out. Uh, 
right? So this was a century long, but they fought, right? And so these people were not going to give their country up, and they used booby traps, they used all kinds of weapons, used everything they could to try to sustain or keep their country, right? So then the U.S. would decide, well, let's drop Black American soldiers into this sort of hotbed of problems, right? Let's drop them in there. And they become, in, in evidence, 20, 10 to 20 percent of the forces that will be there, right? Uh, um, and uh, they had these sort of programs like Project 100, right, that, that directly was engaged in sort of recruiting Black men um, to go and fight, right? And you say, well, what does all this got to do with uh, Operation Move? Well, you could do a little colonial thing if you want to get off theoretical, and this is what people do sometimes. They'll try to collect the ideations of what Move was doing in John Africa to maybe Ho Chi Minh, and that's nice. You got something there. Right, but careful because it's very theoretical and, and it's sort of getting that aspects of it and it's very interesting, right? But, but let me add that you would have to ground it or at least substantiate it as something that could say, you know what, let's look more critically at some of these just more pieces of this, right? The pieces of this, right? And make this the sort of connection of colonialist sort of um, <coughs> programming and planning. Right? And, and, and the large numbers of black soldiers who go over there and fight. And how do those folks come back to their inner city communities, right? I ain't gonna talk about colonialism, right? How do they come back? It's not, it's not Ho Chi Minh uh, ideates John Africa, which is nice, I keep saying it, but it's the soldiers after they come back who don't get the services that they need, who get exposed to things like Agent Orange, who are the first generation maybe where People are recognizing to some degree this post-traumatic stress syndrome. But, I mean, uh, starting to pay attention to it a little bit more. And the scholarship is coming out, but the, people aren't being treated, right? This is the, these are folks who go and go and fight hard for their country and come back injured and just receive no support. And again, I mean, I know some of these people. So this is why I know that this, there's some realness to this, right? And these are folks who come back into communities, right? Like Philadelphia, like Chicago, like Los Angeles, like New York right, inner city communities and come back, there's no jobs, right? If you've ever seen dead presidents, right? You probably ring a bell. There's a, there's a great, uh, uh, you, know, you know, it's a great film based actually on, on a book by someone by the name of, a book called, by Wallace Terry called Bloods, right? Which is actually about the, the life of uh, black men who fight in uh, um, Vietnam. Right? I mean, that's what the story essentially describes there. Um, but uh, 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 he took that story. He took one of those stories from there and made that uh, did, uh, Dead Presidents uh, um, 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 a movie, which is actually interesting. But they, I mean, like, look, look at what they end up doing. If you guys know the movie, uh, we, we may touch on this on, uh, in class as well. Right. What, what, this is the backdrop. This is the backdrop. Just like this piece is a backdrop. This is a backdrop. Right. Another piece is a backdrop. Is the motivation on the on the minds of Black folks to say we got to you know even in the wake of the end of the Civil Rights Movement, right? The assassination of King, the assassination of Malcolm X, right? Uh, you know all these people who be, are, are murdered, and uh, we talk about maybe movement or lack of movement or this sort of disillusionment, this sort of cynicism, and it definitely is 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 flowing in this, right? No question about it. But it didn't mean that people didn't did not completely lose sight of and believe in and focus on an ideation of this sort of uh, you know strengthening and creating sort of zones of black empowerment. Right, as much as they could, particularly in the urban spaces, right? And so that is what uh, the festival in LA was about, Watch Stacks. Um, we maybe we'll look at a clip of some of this as well, so you can sort of see what this was about. But it was a celebration of that in seven degree, but also for us, it's a reminder of things, right? There are another event is uh, um, the uh, uh, you know convention in uh, Gary, Indiana, there that, that brought together people all from all walks of life who were focused on this issue of black nationalism. I mean, that's a spectacular event in its own right. Right, the convention. And these two things happen, you know, as you can see there, four years after the death of King. So this sort of argument maybe that the move, movement diminishes, I mean, it's open for some debate, I think, right? It was this body of people who were contending for the national leadership of the Black community in the early 1970s. It's a very significant statement, right? And this is about the, uh, the, uh, um, the, the convening of the conference in Gary, right? Um, to, to, uh, to really work out a platform for, for black empowerment. And it was, and it was you could imagine the rift between the black nationalists and the black elected officials probably was 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 palpable. I'm sure folks was probably going down in their arguing, well, you could feel really look on Twitter, you'll see yourself. So it's this type of thing. Um, but again, why is this a backdrop to um, the features of and, and the parameters are and the contours of this sort of operation move? 
Well, because once again, you have a political ideation, a, a notion of black nationalism that of course includes pan-Africanist ideas like those that John Africa is talking about, right? That were still vibrant in the minds of people. Right? And you'll see how vibrant, you know, as we watch some of the film and hopefully you get a chance to watch it yourself in your own right, um, you'll see, you know, the, the, the vibrancy of, uh, of his philosophy of the worldview that was shaped out of and in response to, and then largely oftentimes just straight in resistance to, um, um, you know, a sort of system here in the US, right? And I, I mean, for good and for bad, as you can see, as you will see, as the, as the, that's what's so spectacular about the piece. It speaks to the human condition, right? And that's what I really, that's what I really like about it. Uh, um, the, the operation move as a sort of narrative, narrative or backdrop for, for all of this, right? Uh, but this kind of thing too. I mean, politically, what's what, what's going on, right? I mean, what's happening? You know, there's always got to you got to have a sort of somebody um, not really minding the shop very good. I think politically to, uh, to allow and facilitate some of the sort of real, real, um, you know, misrepresentation or exploitation of people. I, I mean, I just think that maybe. You have to sort of have that, you know. Um, but you, but you got a Nixon that's an interesting character, you know. And careful how you maybe you, you, you want to completely classify him as as such, you know. He's part of what will facilitate engagement with China. I mean, maybe that's partly why people say, "Well, you see, this is what it is." This, but you didn't know that in, in seventy when you went over and opened up China. No, you did. Um, in fact, uh, that was a, that was a lifeline to the American economy. If you want to be frank, and if you think I'm playing, look on the shirt behind to see what's on the back of your shirt, and you'll see, right? That type of thing. So I mean, it was very very relevant, right? Also, it was in, you know, endorsed the ERA uh, and the EPA, right? So, reform around environment and also a women's reform, right? He supported both of those things, right? Um, amidst uh, the RFK and the King assassinations, right? Um, but he does sort of engage. These are the ways that we start seeing, like, okay, all this sounds nice that he's he's doing, and he maybe did. It was more foreign policy stuff. This is great, but when you start cutting down to some of the sort of the domestic stuff. I mean, anyway, I'm not being an apologist for uh, Richard Nixon, just for the, the point of clarity. Um, but uh, this is this is what starts to show his true colors, right? The Southern strategy to realign the Republican Party, right? Uh, um, and th these are the folks who start saying, like, you know, as, as we went back to what our prior conversation was about how people say, well, all these grants, all these resources we're getting, this is too much, you know. This is remember, uh, 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 Lyndon Johnson is is. Who, who was part of that great society in an effort to get billions of dollars into inner city communities now has decided he's not gonna run again, right? He's done, right? And 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 within, you know, you know, here, and this is, you know, uh, Andre Nixon, right? Who comes with a different sort of view on this, right? Um, and, and certainly we'll, we'll, we'll look at the civil rights and, and, and start to use this language. And it's, it's, it's coded, but it's not that coded. I mean, dog whistles and RC, you know, that, I mean, that's clear, right? He sees it as straight as kind of productive and the Southern strategy. What do you think the Southern strategy to realign the Republican Party would be, right? Well, it would be the one that the Democrats used maybe several generations earlier to keep uh, things like uh, the uh, reduction of the, the, the value of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment to keep Jim Crow in place, right? This, that's what the Democratic Party did. But the Republicans adopted this strategy of sort of saying this sort of states' right kind of thing, like we the people, this sort of rhetoric, right? This is the beginning of the ways in which those ideas, which really have been those of the Democrats of the 19th century around maintaining and sustaining a racist ideology, Jim Crow era South, this, uh, somehow the Republican Party somewhere in there starts drinking up that Kool-Aid. And next thing you know, you know, here we are, 2016, there you go. You know, but anyways, um, so this, and then even he starts to sort of uh, undo some things on the foreign policy side too, even, I, I guess, I mean, because, well, definitely, it's a horrible thing that he does. It's a horrible thing that he does. And the secret bond, but it's horrible that we are there. So all Nixon does is just, you just, that's just, he's just gas on, on a fire that's already burned, right? So by the time he's over there secretly bombing Cambodia, yeah, okay, that's bad too, but damn, you guys, I mean, you've been carpet bombing, you put more bombs on Vietnam than you did some, I think the, the, the estimates are there more bombs dropped during Vietnam than there were during the entirety of World War II, something like that from planes. And I'm like, come on, that's just ridiculous on this little strip of, of land. Are you kidding me? Right, this kind of thing, so, so, so. But any, but anyway, by seventy-five, anyway, you got your, you know, Hotel Hanoi event where people are hanging on helicopters to get up out of the place because under uh, North Vietnamese, we take the entire country, anyways, right? I mean, this was they, this is what we, uh, we, we were describing there, right? It takes them a century or so, 
I said, I said, oh yeah, almost a century, almost a hundred and um, some 20 years nearly to get their, 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 their land, to get your country back, right? Um, and then the tensions, of course, with uh, Watergate and the Democratic National Convention and his resignation in 74, right? These kinds of things. But this, these are the backdrop. To, yes, this is the political backdrop to events that will occur in like Operation Lee. Yes, right? Right here, it's getting us even closer, right? It's looking at um, the sort of consistency of economic decline, right? Stuff like the Moynihan Moyn Report, which yes, echoed prior efforts by um, folks like Drake and Caden, their, their book, uh, Black Metropolis, uh, researchers who have been going into the South for ages. Um, the name of the, the gentleman's name just goes right out of my head just very quickly there. Um, but also Zora Hurston a little bit. She did some off echoing some off of these folks um, and their research. Um, but there have been prior sort of study of the black experience and how it was creating a pathology of these kinds of problems, right? Um, delinquency, illegitimacy, drug addiction or alcohol addiction, poor educational performance, no education. Right, uh, 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 and people were pointing those out. This is what I mean, and I guess sometimes I get very, very cynical in these spaces because of the sort of rhetorical nature of this sort of thing, you know, um, and the need, I guess, for something that's going to have to be very, very, very much more different. But that, you know, radically thought out. But hopefully, you know, hmm, we'll, we'll see where we go, you know. But uh, I mean, I mean, the idea that these things are new um, and all this sort of stuff is just, I mean, I mean, come on. This is why, you know, this again, I mean, me, I'm, I'm totally laughing at that, you know, because come on, three centuries, three, three centuries of unimaginable treatment, enslavement, uh, strained urbanization and unemployment. Yes, three centuries, right? Hmm, that would increase economic recession. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, generally amongst black people, well, you know, people sort of exist in a state of economic recession and instability, ex exempt extent in that state of, 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 of being, right? But <laughs> maybe sort of in the, in the 60s and 70s, there's also recession and instability, right? I mean, I mean, you know, I was we were little, but I can remember the gas line, people you didn't have to get gas in their car and, and uh, this kind of thing. We talked to some folks who were around you know, during the 70s, they'll tell you some, 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 some stories, some interesting stuff, but like, you know, people had to wait for gas, man, you got two miles, you can get it. I'm talking about a lot of long lines, you know? This type of thing, right? And there were some changes. There were some changes that occurred. There, there was a, a, an increasingly uh, growing black middle class, right? And there also there had always been some black elite. I mean, those the black elite who have been in this country have wealth and resources. Not all the same people and all the same families. It's not a freaking Rothschild conspiracy, some hood, uh, you know, something like of that nature. But um, you know, yeah, you, you have elite. There's black wealth that have been a feature of some of these societies. I mean, going back to, you know, you see the 1619 world, but just sort of, everybody says, oh, they got, they got all taken away, okay. I mean, you know, this kind of thing, there's, there, 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 there's wealth and there's resources and people take advantage of them and know how to maneuver even amidst slavery and amidst the chaos of race and Jim Crow era and stuff. Because some people still have that money. How they how they owe money? How's their black owe money then if, that, if I'm making that up, right? All right, I'm sorry, I'm, I just, Peripheral conversations, but, 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 but relevant, right? Um, but, but so you have it, and you have a, a growing a black middle class, right? But the gap there is as is, is, is described between uh, wealthy whites and blacks is narrowing, right? Uh, uh, um, for sure, right? Um, but what do you think? I mean, I mean, how, what does it take a rocket scientist to see this kind of thing? If you're already at the point you're in the seventies, you're in three centuries of unimaginable what, what we're describing here, right? And no real concerted effort to turn the corner. I mean, as like, you know what, bam, this is enough. This is the mistake. We're going to put a concerted effort. This is the, the we're declaring a war on, you know, three centuries of unimaginable treatment. We need a war on three centuries of unimaginable treatment. You know, they're not even declaring a war on that. They didn't declare that war. In fact, they declared a war on, on drugs and then went, they gave people the green light to go in and, and, and act and act more of this mess. You know what I mean? So, so, so this, this kind of a thing. Right, uh, uh, um, and even in, in, in the politics themselves, there's some things that are changing, right? Um, I mean, emergent political power, uh, Republican power base in the early 80s, right? And yeah, this is in, in the wake of, in the beginnings of, and in the context of the Operation Move event, right? Um, rift between, um, yeah, of this, some, 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 some people know of this from, from very sort of real and firsthand sort of experience, right? The sort of tension between these two groups 
uh, over issues because sometimes somebody gets ahead and other people feel like, well, you got there, but I, you know, you still this, you just a generation out of this kind of thing. I don't know. That's not everybody's story though. Please believe me. It's not, it's not everybody's story. I love to hear the narratives of, you know, folks who can talk around, you know, around their, their, their stuff a bit differently. Right. Or who, who may have been part of these sort of black, black wealthy elites and other things, or, or, or just from all different walks of life, different experience landowners. I, I mean, like agricultural farmers and others as, as black people. And then their sort of perception of politics and other things, which is going to be different from ours. As you could imagine, right? But anyways, uh, uh, um, some changes uh, occurring and some tension between various sort of sort of sort of sort of peoples, right? The same stuff that you sort of see today, right? Uh, um, and, and then in those moments, you stir in the events like the Clarence Thomas events and, and those things that were occurring as he was uh, seeking to get a, a appointment to uh, the Supreme Court, as people called out, just like they did recently on a, on a just a prior. Um, events people called out and said, you know, this guy's involved in some things that are are, are, are very, 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 very um um clearly sexual harassment, if not worse, right? And um, in today's world, you know, he would have been on the butcher block for sure for some of this kind of a stuff. Uh, but at that time, um, this was new. The, the the outcry was uh, was new. So then, in that sense, uh, um, people as you heard the history books and now the uh you know sort of modern folks talk about some of our current political players played a role in some of that and oftentimes to a to, to the degree of sort of silencing a voice like that of uh, anita hills when it came to everything that was going on right but 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 once thomas is in office the other thing that sort of adds to several people's questions around him is that um, they start to sort of, he starts to agree with others that make the case that there's a delineation between civil rights and affirmative action, right? So then in that way, um, voting rights and intention of them discrimination is different from a discriminatory outcomes and statistical measures of that kind of thing, right? And they're, for me, they're just, they're, 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 you know, they're part of the same tree, obviously, right? But again, this is a political effort to clearly delineate these two and these people like this What's this guy? This Dish Danusia, I forget his name, D'Souza, whatever his name is. And uh, there's a couple other folks uh, who write in this tone of this sort of rhetoric and talking of this sort of, well, you know, civil rights was one thing, but now affirmative action is something that's is, is, is dramatically different and we don't need it and this kind of thing. And, and again, it just misses the point. That sort of effort to delineate politically misses the point because you haven't even sort of, sort of, sort of investigated two of these as, as its history, as culture. And, and even maybe from a, a sort of a lens that said, well, let me critically see what's really happened. And let me do some comparative analysis in my own way. But these, they, that's not what, all right, I'm not behaving, but that's not what the, the goal is there. So it's a political argument that's being made. But anyways, um, would that cause tension? Do you think? I mean, I mean, I mean uh, you kind of removed from it now. You know, some, some, some of us maybe who are listening to this, we're probably even born during this time, but I, I know this is time. Um, yeah, it, 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 I know this time. I can remember these these these, these moments. Um, they're still fresh in my mind because of the sort of way in which um, this kind of thing would occur, right? The way in which uh, 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 it could be used. You could say, oh, I champion civil rights, but I don't think we should be allowing, you know, uh, a percentage of people that go to a certain school to be black, right? You're making the distinction between, I don't know. Funny stuff, man. And then you, and then it was like you know going to college <laughs> as this stuff was playing out. You know, I mean, Reagan obviously was early, but you know, this this played into my my, my years as a college student in the nineties for sure. Um, these sorts of questions, and problems continue to persist. No questions, right? Um, and because yeah, the, the policies were carried out by George Bush Senior. Of course, they 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 perpetuated into those to those moments, right? And, and the tension of that time was still there, but. You know, they, you know, it was just funny because like, you know, people would be struggling to be in school, myself included, struggling to be in school. And you would talk to somebody else and they'd go up there and just write a young check for the whole year. <laughs> and pay for the whole year for the tuition, you know? So that's kind of thing could just set the reality of this, right? If you want to notice the, the, the lens through which people are seeing some of the problems we have today, I mean, I mean, I mean, the good, the effective sort of critique of and, and, and social commentary draws, looks all the way back, comes back and said, look at this. See how long it's been going on? And you know, you can go back a couple other generations if you want to get uh, technical, but let's look, come back here. Come back here just to the 80s and look at this. And look at how people were undermined economically to even participate in this sort of economy. Um, 
Um, and then and now you're at a place where the, the economic gap between folks is like um, one to ten. And then and now you want to try to talk like it's it's I don't know how what how did this occur? I couldn't figure it as part of the American account. Da, da, da. And anyways, I mean, I don't want to get so peripheral, but we want to be clear about how these things are intersecting and, 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 and particularly in the, in, in the minds of folks. What, what's going to make somebody want to think is logical or agree with the idea that in a, in a black neighborhood in Philadelphia of working class people who have struggled to get that neighborhood, that some black people who didn't even live in that neighborhood bought a brownstone and set up shop and the sort of shop that they set up was they were going to resist those uh, folks who have been fighting them and, and, and modify the land significantly to their liking, right? I mean, it's, 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 you can see the space. I'm not, and I'm not, and I'm, not, I'm just saying again here, this is the sort of way you got to sort of, sort of maybe come to some better terms with some of what it, it can be a part of this exchange, right? Uh, uh, um, I mean, this is what's going on in this in this space. Some folks who had, are, were in that working class neighborhood in Philadelphia where all this occurred had just bought a house and just had probably just had enough money to be able to save and set up shop there. And I'm not, I'm just saying this is the this is the backdrop to these events, is what I'm adding here. Right. Um, and some, you know, you know, but again, Reaganomics and then the conti continuation of those policies by George Bush Sr. Uh, um, were the things that really, really undermined and undercut uh, um, for a generation. It's just where things, why we are where we are now. In a lot of ways, I'm sorry. It just, those, those are the features of it, right? And people voted that in and looked at these good folks as these are great statesmen. And, and, and compared to uh, other sort of, uh, of uh, folks who, who, who claim to be public members of the Republican Party, uh, um, yeah, they looked like, uh, like statesmen, elder statesmen, George Bush Sr. and his son. But, but, but in, in reality, though, um, they, they greenlighted this sort of rhetoric and these ideas of these kinds of domestic policies that hurt inner city communities. Like George Bush Jr. wrestled with it a little bit better. I'll say that to his credit. Uh, uh, um, but uh, the tension here of this sort of stuff, right? Um, and then even him going into office, George Bush uh, Jr., in 2000, and the tension between him and Al Gore. Now, I mean, that's pushing past Zoom, uh, move, obviously. But but this is the this is this space. We have to look at all this. We have to look at these events because they're all sort of sort of sort of uh, playing off of each other, right? Uh, um, how is it that um, Gore versus Bush is so close in the first place? Well, with the level of disenfranchisement that many people have made a case for in Florida, okay. Right. And then now, so here you go to 2020. I mean, again, I mean, these are these, these are the, these are the pieces of this, right? So yeah, you, you, you could make the case for some second class citizenship and the tension of second class citizenship, right? 53.3% uh, of all African Americans from single families, you know? And it's a thing, it's a, it's a tough piece. And that's not to take away from anybody who comes from a single home. Because I, you know, I, 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 I got, I, I, you know, this is just the reality of the experience. That's people come from single homes, right? Um, that's that's just part of it. But 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 you could see something dramatic happening here if you're going to argue maybe that there may be the sort of ideas of family, right? And even if you say, well, you know, family can mean a lot of things, and it can. But I'm talking about within community itself. There's nobody there to still pick up from that, from this guy there, or this or this young woman who doesn't have uh, um, a father figure, or maybe doesn't have uh, a mother figure there, right? Either either dynamic is not entirely feasible, right? Especially if you don't have mentorship and resources in the community that are helping and facilitating. And you need those kinds of things. They help to build for strength and right? for community strength. Uh, um, and then you add, mix in another little piece in there, right? All these families are at the income, at the, at the low income level, near the poverty level, at or below the poverty level, right? 55.5, more than half, more than half single family, more than half poverty level, right? And and, and then the, the, the death rate of African-Americans um, was 21.5 firearm deaths per 100,000 population, right? Um, and the second and third, 9.4 and 9.0 percent. That's from the National Center of Injury Injury Position in 2007. We do the 10 year. I wonder. I wonder what it looks like now when you do the 20. When you do this one, maybe we can look it all up in class. But this has got to tell us something. I don't know. This is why I don't. I, this is what I look at when people start saying, you know what? Uh, you know, I hate the way the media always glasses up and gasses up the fact that um, black men are, are being killed 
black men and women are being killed. And it's true. The media loves to turn that story on and turn it on TV. I ain't gonna lie to you. Everybody knows that. They always have. This is a what, that's how they make their money. I mean, they want people to watch, of course. But you can't get, go ahead and tell me how that statistic is, is a distortion of the media and, uh, and of the powers that be and of, as part of a broader conspiracy. To this, this, the broader conspiracy is that, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know it's, it's, it's us that's being, that's being tore off for me. That's the broad, that's the broad conspiracy. And, and for me, uh, and couple it with things like AIDS, which you know has been sort of, of uh, reduced in in, in 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 years, right? It's, it's come down, right? But we see now, especially now, um, the way administering of treatment and um, finding our resources within communities, the the, the you know the, the 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 issues that are laid bare in terms of our COVID pandemic and our inability, in some instances, to respond to needs of Black and Latino. And, and other minority communities, right? This is was a this was a beacon. What happened with HIV/AIDS was a light to say, you know what? This is look. This there's big discrepancies here. We better start thinking about how we can provide services to folks in a more viable way. The research is there. It's not new. So so when you so then when you get to a moment where something comes that can be very you know uh, um, problematic, you see um, this kind of thing, right? And then you know corrections, which I think probably you know you could you could could join with some of these, very easily, right? Uh, uh, um, and this sort of evidences and researches again of of how uh, our folks are going and looking at scores and looking at performance levels of students to determine how to sort of gauge out a plan for creating uh, systems of incarceration. Just the fact that those two are together in such close proximity. I don't even need to know the weather or the not. I know that education and correction are, 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 are intersecting in ways that raise some problematic questions, right? Um, is enough to tell, tell me that, hey, something about what's happening here needs to sort of be uh, in a state of a fix or, 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 or repair. And, it's, and, and there's a lot involved to, and, 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 you know, there's just a lot there, man, in terms of going after it and sort of really saying, you know, how do we make a fix? How do we do something impactful that's going to be transformative? And, and we're at this sort of place now in light of these kinds of things. And, and then the sort of, you know, and I'm sure we'll get into in class the way, okay, this is 1960, this is 1970, this, this is stuff I'm talking about in the 70s and the 80s, right? So what does it look like in the 2000s, right? You know, um, and let me, let me touch on, I got a couple more little things here I wanted to jump on to, uh, because, the, you know, uh, uh, I like talking about this issue, I mean, because it, again, it, it sort of shows where things are in a lot of ways relative to uh, um, one of our wars, right? Our big wars again. Like we didn't de declare a war on uh, unimaginable centuries of uh, uh, of unimaginable, you know, treatment of people. We didn't declare a war on that. Say, let's declare war. We said, nah, let's declare war on drugs. Let's let's get the drugs up out of here, right? Just say no, right? Again, from if you were a kid from the '80s, you remember? Well, I got none of y'all. So, but uh, if you know, you know, you remember? You know, they put the egg in a in a pan, they fry it. Now it seems kind of cachet, or whatever. Now, but you know, those are totally. People, people, I mean, that was a real, it was on TV, you know what I mean? Uh, when they were trying to get people to do it. Nancy Reagan was going around, if you remember different strokes back in the day with a, a Gary Coleman, who was this sort of um, young child star. And you know, they were, they, it was a whole piece, man. They were going, just say no, Mr. T, I pity the fool. Come on, I know y'all know about some just say no, right? All that stuff, right? Oh, and it's not a bad thing. I mean, that, that in itself wasn't bad. And I, I, I would question the intentionality of people who would say that that was a bad thing. But, 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 but I mean, certainly silly and certainly in the context of everything else that was going on, that's where you could sort of lens it as this is just not, I just, it doesn't, it can't be acceptable. It can't, it can't make sense. It just can't. And people say, well, you're too overly cynical. No, no, because at the same time you're talking about saying no on drugs, you're green lighting, putting those drugs into those communities. That is just like, I don't, you, you can call me cynical. What are you talking about? I'm just laughing at you because that isn't, it's just, that's just ridiculous, right? And then now here again, again, if you're going to draw, let me, I'm giving clues to my, 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 my colonial, my new colonial theorists because we have a lot of them, but a lot of them need some clues, right? So here's another clue for my colonial theorists, right? Um, get into the aspect of what happens in Nicaragua and what are the, uh, and how long has the United States been there? 
how long has the United States been there? And it goes back to, right, right, some very, very early sort of events here. And all I'm gonna just bring you up to is the Sandinista Liberation Front, right? Who was after uh, and supporting of a guy from the 1930s, the Sandinista, who um, essentially gets caught, gets killed. And the, Green, the United States sort of doesn't say much about it, right? And then um, Somoza becomes the man in, 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 in the region, right? And what does, uh, <laughs> What does FDR say? He may be a son of a bitch, but he's our son of a bitch, right? That's what he said about Samoza. So now you go ahead and you tell me how long and what's really going on. You wanna have a colonialist conversation. Let's have one, right? Let's have one because this is getting at, a, at, at, at the issue. And I was at the tail end of a, of a sort of American foreign policy system. Now we're getting to colonialism that had at its root colonialist ideations about how to treat these states. You know, they called the Caribbean and Latin America, America's backyard, because we ran, we called the shots on that. Oh, we're going to get into it next week. Don't worry. We'll get into it next week because we're going to talk about Caribbean and Latin America. That's in two weeks. I'm sorry. That's the next subject we're going to have. But, anyways, um, what's that got to do with all this stuff, right? Well, I mean, come on. This is part of the features of, of the gutting out of these communities. What else is going to help the inner city? What else is going to help gut our communities, right? Will, 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 will crack help gut out communities? Well, the answer is, a, is an obvious one to that one, right? Uh, and yeah, mushrooms that magnify and exploit it and folks like Nancy Reagan and other people, crack babies, all this sort of this sort of litany of problems that will come along with the classification and problems sort of spectacle, you know, of, of folks that were oftentimes uh, minority or black folks, because those are the ones who fit in those economic spaces, right, could be objectified in the context of all of this, right? But really what so sort of what, what becomes laid bare um, in, in a series of events there is, is um, how it is that the United States is actually involved in this, right? And the, the events like encircle the lives of some people. Some of you guys know aspects and features of this story, right? You see Rick Ross up there. One is Rick Ross, who I think was a football player and a security guard. Uh, and then one is Rick Ross, who was a known drug dealer in Los Angeles, right? Uh, who was the real deal and actually had ended up going to jail, actually ended up coming out of jail concert with all that, that was uh, unfolding and occurring, right? Uh, um, but, but it's just great because you get to see uh, uh, the head of the uh, CIA try to defend what the CIA is doing in front of uh, a committee of folks uh, um, and uh, on a C-SPAN. So we'll watch a bit of that. And a lot of this will sort of play out, these questions and problems. But but just the idea that the U.S. Um, the back the constructs, those who were um, fighting against the Sandalese the Liberation Army, right? Those who were fighting uh, 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 against being occupied, right? The United States was back in there, the Contras, right? Those who were there to in, to be insert to, to 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 stop the Sandinistas, right? The anti-Sandinistas, the Contras, right? Uh, with cocaine, with drugs, right? Into the eighties and into the nineties, and it ties into so so much, man. There's that whole, I mean, there's a whole couple another piece of this that just gets into this narrative. Uh, of really nailing down, well, 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 you know, the United States is very directly involved in this process of this kind of thing. It, it connected there, the CIA for sure. Uh, is, is, is very much so involved with this, right? And had been from its start. It becomes clear. Uh, I'm not gonna, we'll watch the C-SPAN. You can, you, can, you can judge for yourself and do your own research on the, on the, on the issue, right? Clinton presidency and other things. I'm just rounding this this, this phase out into the beginning of the era of the 2000s, really, you know, because that's sort of the I would I would call the sort of the wake of the new piece, right? It's probably about 80 from to, to, to 2000. The impact of this, right? If we look at it and sort of on the historical, at least just the one I'm proposing. All right, we'll call that. Um, but in that space, you know, you got a Clinton presidency that comes in and comes with a different sort of, of worldview and approach, right? Um, you know. Um, that in, in included things that he sort of could offer to the Republicans to sort of satiate their crying about different things and their concerns about different things. Um, Personal Responsibility Act, uh, these strikes, uh, this kind of thing. Uh, uh, but uh, you know, again, you can see some sort of some sort of duplicities there, even with uh, the, the, the the Clinton presidency. And, and I think that um, um, this is part of a shift. The centrist policies and the ways of, of uh, lowering unemployment and, and, and poverty rates, these were helps for folks. I mean, we would be willing to sit again and say that we didn't see things begin to get, appear to begin to get a little bit better, right? But you still had this quote unquote underclass that a very famous uh, sociologist began to investigate, right? 
he was pointing to this joblessness, the social isolation, minimal education, lack of community safeguards and resources. So if anything, again, we see the pathology at work again for all of this, because it's not, it doesn't stop, here we are again. So it moved and shine a light on, the civil rights didn't shine a light on it, this didn't shine a light on it, so what? I mean, you know, this, this type of thing, right? And, 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 and school's in flux, right? See what white flight is doing in, in, in communities, right? And I'm gonna look. I, I'm gonna sort of specify Chicago here, but but uh, uh, is uh, um, you know people just when they leave, then the city sort of got gutted out. When you had uh, um, you know these more well-to-do and economically, um, the people who had the money to go could go, right? The idea was to head to the suburbs, right? And now you know you can see how it's sort of changed. Gentrification, other things, sounds kind of come full circle in many ways, right? But the economics are still playing all of this, right? It's power that's at work. I mean, I mean, uh, uh, for sure, you know. But 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 the end result, what it will mean is by the early '80s, uh, the school systems in Chicago were one of the worst in the nation, no question, right? Uh, um, the worst. Um, so there had to be massive, massive changes, right? And brought on part by some of the reforms that Mayor uh, Harold Washington did and carried out to some degree by. By Richard M. Daly, but I think certainly that aspect of, uh, um, of uh, bringing parent control into the schools and this kind of thing, small school movements. Uh, I mean, some of this has been quite beneficial. Right? We could talk about features of it, but certainly too, uh, some people would make a case that suburban schools um, still have just sort of real ultimate uh, accessible resources, and they leave some of these other schools out in the lurch. And I think you could still could sort of argue some of that. I think also too, we could, you know, one of the ways to sort of investigate, investigate it, again, is another effort, government effort to sort of say, we're gonna fix things, a no child left behind era, right? This was a this was a proposed reform to educational systems too. And people watched it come and watched it go. So, I mean, I don't know. I'm just we're looking at all of this. And if anything, I mean, I mean, I, I guess I end on a cynical note some because I just, it seems very rhetorical. We've been wrestling with the need for education since the Freedmen's Bureau, since the first people and the civil war. And before that, if you want to get technical, but let's call it, let's start with the beginning of this, the end of the Civil War, the Jim Crow era. People were saying, hey, man, people need schools, right? You go back to the presidents and things and presidents being able to garner the support of the black community and then maybe or maybe not meeting those goals and promises and commitments that they make, right? Go back to somebody very, very early and you could make a very strong case for that, right? One of the first people elected um, to office, right? Um, one of a very famous, famous general is from somewhere here um, in Illinois, um, right? Kalina, right? Anybody know who I'm talking about? <laughs> I'll give you big money if you can tell me. Ding, ding, ding. The clock is ticking. The clock is ticking. No one, no one knows. Well, we'll I'll, I'll see if someone knows in class. Um, but uh, again, I mean, you got this. I mean, I mean, so so you got presidents who who made promises to black people, garnered that vote, going back to the era of the 1860s. I'm going to give you another hint, 1868, uh, um, and still didn't necessarily meet those promises. So people have been playing off that. I guess we could say black votes sometimes or lack thereof uh, for some time, right? Uh, there's always been these sort of problems of the sort of way in which on the surface, one thing is being said and promised and committed by our government and by, but then maybe on another side, the security apparatus of our government maybe has other kinds of plans, right? So on one side, we might be talking about, oh, let's help the people, let's save the people, let's hands across America, let's stop all the violence. And then on another hand, this could be as, as, as blanketly duplicitous as, you know, just facilitating the import and exchange of guns and weapons in communities. Uh, just as easy as doing it. And, I, and I'm not even saying this is the directly responsible or that is directly responsible, just the duplicity of those two things, right? Just reminds us that something's not right, you know? Um, or, or now, you know, you, you talk about a security apparatus that includes a, a very enhanced surveillance state. And so what is that sort of thing? Where, where does that take us when we, when we talk about, uh, 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 you know, and I mean, for me, like another sort of clear example of a Janice face, this sort of, you know, problem of um, it looks this way when you look in the morning and then you look, it looks like this the next time, right? That's, you know, for me, that's the electronics sometimes can be that. You know, the Facebook and the Instagram and these other features that on one hand, 
tease us in with things. But on the other hand, they had this sort of problematic legacy of the surveillance and maybe some of the sort of problems that it might create in terms of interpersonality and those kinds of things. Anyways, my point here is that you got something consistent. Same thing with second class citizenship. Different criteria would have been the features of it. But you talked about people um, who were slaves of this country. They were second class citizens. Of course, I mean, that was even, all right. Shifts in political ideology uh, around uh, and by black people. Yes. I mean, this has been going on around real tensive issues. If you don't think people wrestled around abolition and the questions of slavery and also questions like immigration, so we leave this country, black nationalism. I mean, that shows us these they're wrestling issues, right? Black people in a, in in a, in a sort of state of this flux um, economically. I mean, everyone but this unimaginable treatment, this three centuries of strained urbanization and unemployment, right? Economic recession and instability, existing in that space, right? It's, just, it's not, it isn't new. And the betrayal by the federal, you know, sort of system. That's what many people call the nadir, the low point. They call it the low point. The, the, after the end of the Civil War, it's called the nadir because why? Well, because uh, 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 Rutherford B. Hayes gets elected and they betrayed uh, um, the presidents. I mean, they betrayed the promises of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. Okay, so that isn't new, right? And neither is, is black activism. Obviously, you know that goes back to the very beginnings. I mean, the the, the uh, parades, uh, the what 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 uh, Emancipation Day, um, Juneteenth. I mean, that's early a performance of celebration uh, um, of our of our culture and our experience. I mean, us serving in the wars. We've been in every war. That's why. I mean, what's the name? Uh, took a knee and people didn't, I mean, the thing about that that was sort of tensive for me was I was kind of like, you know, uh, in the midst of all of it, people couldn't just sort of push back completely and say, you know what, you don't even got a question to ask me. All, all they had to do was start, just start naming off wars. I just started naming off wars. Yeah, I came up and started saying something to me. Republican, I mean, Revolutionary War, War of 1812, we was up in that. World War I, Spanish-American War, uh, Grenada, we went to the <laughs> Grenada War. You know, uh, Vietnam, I mean, come on, we always serve. So how you gonna even, all right. So people try to equate that to one's level of um, uh, patriotism. When we talk about the number of black people who have served in our, in, in our country's wars. And for us to be able to have a voice to say, you know, we have some questions about it because of the way we were treated during our service and all of these wars, right? The idea that now you had to sort of speak to the that desire that you had to kneel. All right, but, but these kinds of things. And even efforts by community leaders and the federal government to institute elements of reform for black people is nothing new. So why are we still where we are now? Urban unrest is nothing new. I mean, urban unrest is what caused the American Revolution, right? Is what, what, isn't, that, isn't that how uh, uh, um, um, the first uh, black person to, to and the first person to actually to be killed in the context of the war, uh, Crispus Attucks? Isn't that what happened to him? Did he get shot? Were they out in the street in some urban in, 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 in a stage of urban unrest? And who was the who were they sending after police to? Not the policemen, but the British colonial soldiers. Okay, so again, I mean, this kind of thing. So what are we, where, and that's why I think the idea of the red ghost is important. A red ghost then as conviction giggles its laugh laugh because we keep like, we keep, we, we still, we can't figure it out or something. I don't know. We can't figure it out. So that's not the best <laughs> note to leave on, but hopefully we'll, we'll spend some on time uh, on really unpacking and investigating critically sort of discussion uh, on this sort of stuff. So we'll end there.